the following in-depth interviews continue the dialogue started with Green Fire, our Emmy award-winning film on the life and legacy of Aldo Leopold. We are pleased and honored to share more wisdom from our thinking community in Voices of Green Fire. Chicago wilderness and an urban land ethic. There are a million different signs around us every day that urban dwellers crave the contact with the land, crave an expression of the land ethic as deeply as Leopold did, as many of his rural followers did, and that uh, the land ethic is not irrelevant to urban and suburban people, but probably of greater importance to them because they're so desperately thirsting for those connections. Everyone is seeking that connection to the land and the rest of nature at our very cores. There's a visual. Imagine, and we have the cities where there are no trees, that all we see is concrete and steel and asphalt and, you know, that's it. That is not a living entity. That is, that is a... Um, that is a construct that is antithetical to promoting life in all phases. What can live in concrete? And better yet, what does the, the overabundance of concrete um, around living creatures, what does that do to them? So I mean, it's, you cannot have a society rooted in concrete. It's unstable. In terms of what Chicago Wilderness um, represents for the world at large in terms of conservation, it represents a model of a community coming together and working in the Leopoldian tradition. And I'm pretty proud of that. By choosing as their umbrella title, Chicago Wilderness, they were making a statement that even within the city, there are wild places that need to be cared for and nurtured, but also that we can connect our understanding of cities to this context in which cities exist. Cities are not apart from the land. Cities are a part of the land, and that's a very Leopoldian way of thinking about the world. Yeah, so about a dozen years ago, a um, few people were talking about how can we really uh, scale up the conservation in this region? This part of the Midwest has a lot of important remnant natural areas that are degraded and really need to get restored and managed. And um, we've got about 360,000 acres of protected land in the Chicago region, and it wasn't getting all the resources that it needed. So we decided a thing to do would be to band together and try to enlarge the conservation pie here. And we've been doing that for, for 12 years or so. Uh, an important part of the um, Chicago wilderness effort, of course, is the professional land managers and the researchers and the uh, uh, people at the big institutions. But another important part of Chicago wilderness is the people like the ones that were here today, the average person who does something else for a living but really um, enjoys being out in natural areas. And this is a way for people to both get some exercise, get some fresh air, and make a, a big contribution to conservation. I have to say, when you tell people what the situation is with conservation, sometimes it can sound like a really gloomy story, so it's really nice to have something positive to tell something that they can do. This is a really unique um, area of the city. It's more um, economically depressed than other areas of the city. It's also got the industrial heritage um, of all the steel mills, which are now gone. And um, what we're all collectively trying to do is envision a new future for the community, which involves greener jobs, um, people engaged in nature, appreciating nature, and, um, and helping to protect it in the long run. And community is key to that. And we want to educate students. We want to work with teachers and community members and get everybody involved. There's room for everyone in this. Here in Chicago, we've got a great movement going called Leave No Child Inside. You know, we, we care that thinking, we care about feeling, but caring for is the action that we need everyone to take in terms of the natural environment. So we've been at this a while. 
and I'm really pleased that Chicago Wilderness, which is a consortium of 214 organizations, cities, government agencies, etc., is involved in this effort in terms of leave no child inside. Some of these students, although they live um, very close to nature and um, close to forest preserves in their community, have never been um, to forest preserves before. Um, their experience of nature is um, it, at best what they're seeing, you know, walking on their way to school um, for a lot of the students. And they just don't get the direct experiences that I got, say, for instance, when I was growing up. Um, and so we're very happy to be able to um, get those students involved and get them out here. It uh, really um, makes our days worthwhile when we see their eyes open up and all the things that they experience when they're out here that they've that never seen that um, to them are, are something new that we may have experienced several times, but it really is different when they see it for the first time. There are a lot of conservationists in the urban areas. There are a lot of people who are attuned to the natural world. Um, and there are a lot that are not, but, uh, and I live day in and day out in the west side of New York. I don't live in the suburbs, uh, but I f I'll bet I would find either as much or more the force of humans and nature in the suburbs as they do in the city. Um, we are not apart from the environment. We are in the environment. And what we do to the environment, we do to ourselves. I, I think a lot of people need to, 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 to grasp that. We cannot focus just on preserving the wilderness. We have to preserve all types of land. And I think that's, that's the challenge. When we started managing the site, it was pretty much overgrown with woody brush. And we've been hacking away at that woody brush for the last 30 years. Um, getting rid of the weeds, getting rid of the buckthorn, moving the seeds around from the remnant areas to the newly opened areas, and we have a lot of work left to do. Although I have to say I'm impatient and that I think that some of the work can get done faster and I'm impatient for us, um, the people of the United States, the people of Illinois, the people of Cook County and the people of Chicago to invest in these landscapes because some, some of them were losing fast and so we do need to we, we we do need to be patient. We do do need to be in there for the long haul, but we also need to step it up. <laughs> in Chicago wilderness, they're making it happen. They're doing it through restoration work, actively bringing health back to the forest preserves and prairies and wetlands of the Chicago area. They're doing it through educational activities that allow kids to reconnect city kids, to reconnect to nature in a way that maybe they have no other opportunity for. They're doing it by also bringing information and knowledge to these tasks. Mostly, however, they're doing it by recognizing that all these institutions, local governments, museums, schools, universities, can and need to work together in place, work together so that they can make their shared place a better place. Because it is about overcrowding and it's about misuse of the land and we are all suffering. Every being, living being, is suffering from that overdevelopment of land. And it carries through, not just in that particular location, it carries through in a region and it carries through nationally. Urban community gardens are making a huge comeback. Um, they're growing all over this country. And you can see the expressions of ethnic identity in them. You know, different groups will have their casitas painted a certain way. People will grow their own food. I went to a community gardening project in Hartford where you could see probably 15 or 20 different ethnicities expressed. And over time, people begin to learn about each other's cultures. They're less afraid of each other. They begin to share tools. They share seeds. They taste each other's foods. Um, so these urban gardens actually are more diverse biologically because they have more different kinds of plants and flowers and herbs and spices. They're also more ethnically. They're more humanly diverse. One of my frustrations with a lot of the discussion about um, the preservation of biodiversity or environmentalism is that it's not enough about culture. That, you know, human, the diversity of human culture and the biodiversity of the land, I think these things go hand in hand. What we're doing here is mostly demonstration and showing how viable the, 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 the idea of an urban fish farm is, how viable the idea of an urban ag 
peace where people are growing and providing jobs where there are no jobs, providing food where there are no stores or grocery stores or produce. And so uh, we're actually, like I said, we're going back to connect to the land, not because it's a good thing to do. It's the only road left off to us at this point in time. It's a necessity. What we need to realize is simple, it's a simple fact that is the majority of the human population, the six billion some people on earth, the majority are already in urban locations in cities and <clears throat> the surroundings of cities all over. You know, here in, in Chicagoland we've got a great urban concentration. It's determining what happens in the rest of this state, in the rest of the region. And we must come to grips with this in, a, in an effective way. And that's why programs such as Leave No Child Inside are so important, because <clears throat> we must engage parents, teachers, other caregivers of the, of the future potential stewards of the land. We must engage them now and effectively. For more information and videos, visit the Green Fire page at humansandnature.org and the Aldo Leopold Foundation YouTube channel. Footage created through a partnership of the Center for Humans and Nature, the Aldo Leopold Foundation, and the United States Forest Service. <laughs>